book of Malachi, chapter number three. I want to read a verse here in this great chapter, the last book of the Old Testament, and it'll be in Malachi chapter three and verse number six. Malachi chapter three and verse number six. And what I what I'd like to do this morning is give you something that will uh, make you think straight, like I usually try to do, challenge you spiritually, I usually try to do, and then pull you to the Lord Jesus, like I usually try to do. And I hope I can do all three of those this morning. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible said here in verse 6, for I am the Lord. See that? I change not. That's what I'm talking about. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, notice that phrase, sons of Jacob. All them Old Testament promises of God are to Jacob. Not just Abraham's seed. Abraham had lots of seed that wasn't Jacob. He had that child Ishmael. That's where all the, the Arabs, Arab come to Ish, Islam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, all of them come down that line from Ishmael. Jacob's son were the children of Israel. All the promises of God in the Old Testament were on the sons of Jacob. I just read it to you. And it's in there a hundred other times. The blessing comes through Jacob and on Israel. And uh, you know what you can do about that? Absolutely nothing. You can agree with it or disagree with it. That's it. You can't change it. And the Lord said here, I change not. I want to encourage you and help you a little bit this morning and tell you this. I'm going to talk about some things that have not changed. Now, are we living in a changing, are you kidding? Are, are you kidding? Every time you turn on the news, every time you meet somebody you ain't seen in a while, the first thing they'll say is, my, have things changed? Things have changed. Things have changed. When we're going back to the old days, when's it going to be like it used to be? When, when's this going to happen? Why? Everything you know changes. Politics have definitely changed. Years ago, man run for political office, he was standing for what was right nine times out of ten, and people voted for him because he did what was wrong. Now, the more wicked, perverted stuff you stand for, the better chance you've got of getting elected. Things have changed. Things have changed. I mean, we're talking majorly. Things have changed in, in the, in the science, world science. You know, they wonder why we as Christians mock and scoff and refuse a lot of what so-called science is because they can't make up their own mind. They change every time you turn around. You know, Charles Darwin believed the earth was only, was only uh, 300 million years old. And that's young earth compared to what they believe now. You know what scientists believe now? Four and a half billion years old. That the earth is silly. Even if it was, they don't know that. There's no way they can know. Well, they don't need, yeah, your, yeah your, your foot, too. That's what that is. That's your foot. Uh, that, that, that's lifeable. You know what that means is? If you keep inventing longer periods of time, that gives time for everything to turn into something that it wasn't. Yeah, that means this. That means this. If you go back far enough, anything live will happen. You know, in plain language, there's your education. Uh, they change your mind every time you turn around. Uh, then, then the thing about what we're going through with this pandemic, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. And they wonder why we don't trust them. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't doubt everything. Look, if something's right, it's right. And real science don't contradict the Bible. Never has. The Bible and science don't come. People say, oh, you Christians don't believe in science. Yeah, we do. We just believe in the real science. Not science falsely so-called like 1 Timothy talks about. That's one of the strongest verses in your Bible. Beware of opposition of science falsely so-called. If something ain't true, it ain't science. You know, they started this thing about when, uh, when this virus first came out. Uh, a year or so ago, and everybody was, they, they told us, they said, look, we're going to shut the gyms down and everything, two weeks, about two weeks, and everything about, you remember that? 
and we fell right for it like suckers. And boy, it's been a little longer than two weeks. And you know whose fault it is? Ours, because we didn't do what they told us to. And and then they came out and they said, uh, uh, to keep from spreading it, we got to have a mask. I ain't saying that's all, that was all wrong or all bad. I ain't the judge of that. I don't know. I know surgeons wear masks. Sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. And there's nothing, nothing wrong. If you don't do it, do it. If you don't, don't. Uh, but they said, everybody's got to wear a mask until we get a vaccine. And after that, we'll be done with them masks. Well, lo and behold, they finally got one and a hundred and something million people took it and they still got to wear it. You know whose fault that is? Ours. Our fault. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't do what we was told, so it's our fault for not agreeing with the science. It's funny they don't agree with the science on abortion, isn't it? Isn't that funny? Uh, the science proves that life begins at conception. That's a scientific fact, but that don't matter, see? Your body, your choice, out the window when it's something to disagree with. I know what I'm saying is controversial, and I'm not even saying it's all wrong, uh, all of it. I'm not. I'm really not. I'm, I'm for being safe. I'm for washing your hands. I'm for not breathing, sneezing. I'm all for that. I ain't stupid. But it, it ain't no wonder we don't believe because it changes every time you turn around. Now they're saying even if you do get vaccinated, you're still going to get it. So you're still going to. What good does it do to start with? Uh, and it goes on and on and on. There's no end to it. What I'm saying is the world changes. The world changes. The world changes. The world changes. Oh, and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, and it's, uh, you can still get it, but it's not as bad, you know. But then there's another kind. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but the world's changing. Either way you cut the cake, the world is changing fast. I'm going to talk about some things that don't change. Number one, you know what never changes? The preciousness of God's record. This record right here. I'm so thankful this morning that this don't change. It says the same thing today as it said 100 years ago. I'm glad they don't come out and say, well, things have changed, so we're going to rewrite the Bible, some tribe, to fit the time that we're living in, to fit this generation. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that we, we don't have to change the Bible to fit our generation. It just stands like a rock, brother, like the rock of Gibraltar or whatever that thing is, and it, you just run into it and bounce off of it. Scientific, science, science, here, history, lessons, comedians, trends, transgenders, shacking up, adultery, drunken, murder, bam, just bounce off of it like BBs off a of Titanic, brother. I'm glad the Word of God never changes. The authenticity of the Bible has not changed. The world laughs at us. You know, the world out there this morning laughs at me and you for believing the Bible. Honest to goodness, they laugh at us for believing a book that is absolutely historically, scientifically, and prophetically correct. They laugh at us for believing that. I don't believe you're scientific if you don't believe the Bible. You're unscientific. Uh, you're taking a chance no, no gambler in Las Vegas would take. Did you know they laugh at us? They say, really, do you honestly believe that all the human beings in the world come from two? Yes, we sure do. You got a better explanation for it? You believe they come from a rock, and then you don't know where the rock come from. That's what they believe. They believe the rock was primordial soup, lightning struck a mud puddle or something. Then over millions and millions and millions of years, there was an amoeba, there was a tadpole, there was a frog, there, and all everything come from that, and they, and they don't know where the primordial soup come from neither. You know, and they laugh at us for believing there's a God that made everything. I'm glad the Word of God don't change. I'm glad I got hooked in with this when I was 18 years old, and I found the truth. And truth has a ring to it, buddy. Truth has a ring to it. And you know, when, when I'd get up and I'd hear these old preachers preach the Bible and it started making sense, something inside me said, that's right, that's right, that's right. It's the only explanation for the, the world being here, how we got here, what we're doing here, and where we're going. It has 66 books. The Catholic Church teaches the Bible has 72 and we lost a bunch of them. That is not true. There's never been, there ain't no lost books of the Bible. There's 66 clearly shown by God's division in the Scripture. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. There's a division after 39. 
and then Malachi, Malachi, Matthew starts with John the Baptist coming, Matthew chapter 1, first book in the New Testament. The perfect picture of that is the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. That's a picture of the whole Bible. That is, cannot be an accident. That cannot be an accident. Isaiah didn't even know there's going to be chapter and verses when he wrote that. He just wrote it on a scroll. So there's wound up being 66 chapters in Isaiah, and to beat it all, there's a division after chapter 39. Chapter 39 ends, and chapter 40, which corresponds with Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, begins with, uh, he'll come make the crooked places straight, prophecy of John the Baptist, just like Matthew. You think that's an accident? You think that, that's just a little, that's just a little thing. 20, 39 and 27, some scholars, so called, believe that there were two different people wrote Isaiah. There's such a division between 39 and 40. Guess what? That's how God divided the Bible, between 39 and 40. 39, the old, 20, uh, 27 in the new, making a total of 66 books in the Bible. You got it right here, buddy. You got it. You got God's final word to men. It tells us how we got here. It tells us there was one God. It tells us he made the whole world and everything in it in six creative days and nights. It tells us that he put two people in a garden, a man and a woman. Both, how did both those sexes evolve uh, differently, huh? You tell me. I, uh, if you invent a long enough time, anything will happen. And uh, they, they are, too, guess what? Facebook has 58 genders. God has two. And they're right here in the Bible. The other 56 are false. That's just somebody wanting to be something they're not or trying to be something they shouldn't be. Say amen. I'm, telling, I'm glad for the authenticity of the Bible. I'm glad God put Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, there's um, most college courses, most seminaries even teach that the Bible was past tense inspired, but we don't have a Bible that is present tense inspired. That is wrong also. God not only promised to inspire his word, God promised to preserve his word. So we can rest assured that when you read these words on these pages, it is God's revelation to man. Somebody said, well, why did he spend so much time talking about them? Because the, the Bible was written for more generations than it's our little bratty age that we live in right now. It was written for people past the Old Testament, people future in the tribulation, people future in the millennium, people future uh, and, and during the, the uh, seven years of the tribulation, three and a half of the great wrath of God. It's, it's written for all of it. So I'm glad the Bible has not changed. Amen. I'm glad the Bible has not changed. Secondly, this morning, I want to say this. God's program for revival has not changed. Now, I know we're living in a time when everybody's changing. Not everybody. I know we're living in a time when preachers are saying, if we're going to have anybody, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to change the atmosphere. We're going to have to change the music. We're going to have to change the way we do things. We're going to have to do everything. I'm so thankful God's plan for revival has never changed change. The same program they always use is the one we still have today. Let me ask you a question, friend. Is it over? Is it too late for revival? I mean, a lot of people think so. They say the world's too far gone and it can't never happen again. I remember the old days when people got saved and they was hugging necks and all them days are gone over. No, no, it ain't over. It ain't over. Our God's still able to do the same thing today as he was back in the revival that I got saved in. You know what? The revival I got saved in ain't like it is now. Nowadays, it's, it's promotions, it's pumping, it's performances, it's priming, it's personalities. You know what it was in the old days? You know what people did back then? It was prevailing prayer, it was powerful preaching, and it was personal purging. That's right. Now you want revival? Can we still have revival? Yes. Can God still move and change and help our, help our families and get our kids and help the boy that's on drugs and help the person that's in a, a terrible lifestyle and get them right with God and serve him? Yes, absolutely God can still do it. There's prevailing prayer there in Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. Now, now the revival that I got saved in 
Uncle Joe Parson. That's what they called him. He's a great old preacher. He's a legend in this part of the country in the Appalachian Mountains. And Brother Joe was one of them old men that get up and pray at 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock, pray for an hour, and walk with God. And there was a lady in Nebo up there, Mrs. Edwards. And Mrs. Edwards got a burden to pray. And she prayed and fasted for three days and nights. And she said, God, get a hold of our community. God, send us revival. And three days and three nights went by, and she said she was so burdened, she said, I'm going to do it again. Three more days, three more nights. Didn't need a bite. She was praying. I didn't know it. I was out there running up and down the road on my riding motorcycle uh, all over Nebo and didn't even realize it. I had long hair. I was rebellious. I'd played in a rock band. I was mean as a snake. And I was, uh, they was in there praying, God, get a hold of our teenagers. God, get a hold of them. I had no idea. But I, I did notice that I was becoming dissatisfied. I noticed that. I remember we played basketball all the time. And I remember I them boys said, Younger, and I got to where I thought, I don't care if I play or not. I, and I mean, I'm telling you, you talked about, I thought I was sick. If I didn't want to play ball. And I said, I remember thinking, is this all there is to life? I remember thinking that. Eating, drinking, pleasure, fun, money, cars, clothes, fun. I mean, and I mean, I was 18, people. And I remember thinking, is this it? Is this our existence? You know what that was? That was the Holy Ghost of God working in my heart, drawing me. To the Lord Jesus. How's God doing that? You people nowadays, we think we got to have a great prayer. We got to have this. We can get people to. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with planning a big meeting. We do it. Nothing wrong with promotion. I do it. But I'm telling you, it takes more than all of that. Can God still send that kind of revival? Absolutely. Yes, He can. Now, I'm telling you, I heard about one of my friends getting saved. And the next thing I know, I was at the church. Me and my cousin, you've heard me tell about it a hundred times. And I went and got saved that Wednesday night. I've never been the same since. There wasn't nothing. Nobody gave me a donut. Nobody gave me a hot dog. I'm not against that. We'll give you one if you want it. But that didn't get me saved. Prevailing prayer. Prevailing prayer. And I'm going to tell you something else, people. If a bunch of us, me, you, all of if we get back serious like we ought to be, get back on our knees like we ought to be, meet in the prayer room, come early and pray and get a hold of God, brother, God can still do that again today. You know why I don't? Christians ain't willing to pay a price. That's why. That's exactly right. Now, I'm telling you this morning, people, they had prevailing prayer. They had prevailing prayer. Preacher Hollifield, my pastor, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. I read about old Samuel Martin, a great preacher. And you know what he'd do? He'd go lock himself in his church every Friday, the church he pastored. And he'd walk around and put his hands on every seat and say, God bless this, whoever sits here, God bless that. You know what preachers today think about that? They think it's silly. I, you don't know the times I've done that. I've been in here and walked all over this place. I've touched every one of them in prayer. Uh, seats up there and prayed for them. I went back through here, and I, and I know where some of you sat, and I spent a little time on your seat. <laughs> God help this person. <laughs> and, and I remember, and, and I, I, I've done that several times. But you know, people nowadays, they think, oh, that's silly. Why don't we just hire the so-and-so, the great singing group to come in? I'm nothing wrong with a great singing group, but people, people need to pray. People need to pray. I guarantee you, God hasn't changed. His plan for revival ain't changed. And God Almighty can steal sin from heaven. We see a little spark of it every now and then. We saw it you throughout. We saw it at camp. We saw it in here. I mean, there's a breeze blowing. There's a spark here and there. But I'm telling you what God does. He responds to people praying. And then they had powerful preaching, buddy. You know what, you know what God's plan for revival is? Powerful preaching. Powerful preaching. Not just saying stuff that's true. Power for preaching. Amen. And old, old, one of the old preachers said, these preachers nowadays ain't got enough power to blow the fuzz off a gander snout. And y'all kids don't even know what none of that is. Uh, but that's what the old preachers used to say. Uh, they don't have enough power to blow a spiritual booger out of their nose. They don't have enough of power. God, I uh, get people in life and cut up in church and it don't bother them one bit where the preacher has no power, where the preacher has no kind of power whatsoever. You know what old Billy Sunday did? Old Billy Sunday, he was the leading evangelist in America 
till, up till Billy Graham, y'all. Till Billy Graham, sort of, Billy Sunday was, was the leading American evangelist. And Billy Sunday packed those big, big tabernacles, hand-built tabernacles, no, no sawdust on the floor, no air condition. And they said he shook hands with a million souls, put their hand in his hand, and said, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. And Billy Sunday was a baseball player. He, he, he had to set the world record for running the bases, running barefooted. I won't let you do that now. But he'd run, run, run the bases barefooted, stumbled out. He stumbled into the, uh, the rescue mission up there in Chicago and got saved. And Billy Sunday started preaching, and he put just as much enthusiasm into his preaching as he did playing baseball. Now, I mean, he'd run back and forth. He, they said he'd break chairs, brother. He'd wind up preaching. with His britches leg wound up, wound up soaking wet and, and, uh, and, and jumping up and down. And you know what he said? He said, the biggest trick the devil's ever pulled on us is when he took the drama and the emotion out of the pulpit and put them on a Hollywood movie screen. And I say, amen, that is true. People have emotions for a reason. A preacher that has no passion, emotion, or any kind of, any kind of uh, uh, excitement in his preaching is dead and forkly. And I ain't talking about just hollering and screaming. I'm talking about real care and real emotion and I'm not talking about noise I'm talking about care and power in her preaching amen Billy Sunday said he said I want to make America so dry you'd have to prime a man before he can spit that's what he said he, is on the, he said get on the bandwagon get on the alcohol wagon uh, and he preached against alcohol and they hated his guts that show that book that Elmer Gantry thing was a book written to mock the ministry of Billy Sunday from Hollywood. That's right. And buddy, old Billy Sunday, he told me one time, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to fight the devil as long as I've got fist. He said, I'm going to kick him as long as I've got feet. I'm going to bite him as long as I've got teeth. And when I get old and fistless and footless and toothless, I'm going to gum him till I die and he goes to hell where he belongs. And I said, amen. God, give us some leather-lunged, old-fashioned Bible preachers that'll say that God still can do it. God still can do it. I know this morning they think we're crazy. I know this morning. I ain't crazy, people. I live in the world. I know how they feel about people like us. They think we've literally lost our mind. But I'm telling you this morning, there is still God in heaven that can still save your children and my children and work in their life. God's not dead. He can still do what he always could do. That never changes. That never changes. Amen? And then I want to say, tell you something else that ain't never changed. God's plan of redemption. The program for revival, the plan of redemption. People have changed. I, I talk to people and they say, I've always been a Christian. No, you ain't. Uh, you might probably ain't one now if you think that. That's right. I'm, I, I hear this all the time. I listen to preaching all the time. I listen to different kinds of preachers, not just those that I agree with on everything. I listen to lots of different kinds of preachers. And these people come on TV and they say, uh, well, I, I, I wondered uh, for a few years, but then I came to faith. And when I came to faith and began my walk with Christ, and I mean, I, I, that's okay, y'all, but that sure is milky. That's a milky testimony. What's wrong with saying what the Bible says? I got saved. I got born again. You know why they say I came to faith? Because that sounds, that don't sound too religious. Don't want to offend nobody. Now, if we are ashamed to say what the Bible says, we cannot expect the blessing of God on us or on our life. Now, there's nothing wrong with being smart. But when you're ashamed, as if I came to faith. You mean you got born again? Is that what you're trying? Are you trying to tell me you got saved? Came to faith? Show me that in the Bible. It ain't in there. Came to faith? You say, well, they mean, oh, what they say? What they mean then? And the enemy tries to, and the enemy, all them preachers talking about the enemy, the enemy. You mean the devil? <laughs> Is that who you're talking about? The devil? You know how you won't say devil? It offends those educated, cultured, smooth, Man told me one time at camp me. I first started preaching, and a, and a real educated preacher pulled me over to the side, and he said, "Danny, now you you've got it, you've got it, you've got." It. It's, I, I, I've had people tell me that they said you have the makings of a great preacher. I don't know what that is, but you just need to trim off a little here, and trim. You wouldn't believe the people's told me that. They said if you just 
cut this out or cut that. If you didn't just say stuff about, and this guy told me, he was he preached, he said, you need to go to seminary and get those rough edges smoothed off. Now, I look at that differently, brethren. A file has edges on it. You know what you can do with a slick file? Nothing. A file's supposed to cut, to cut. It's supposed to cut stuff, cut stuff down. And that's like sandpaper. I'm a, I'm a sandpaper preacher, I guess. I mean, nobody don't like me rub with sandpaper. But what good is a, a slick saw? A saw that has no cutting edge on it ain't no count. And that's exactly what preachers are today. It's just everything's wonderful and it's just so wonderful to have you in the love of God. And, the, and it's true, but it's slick. It's slick. Got to have a little edge. I don't, want the, I don't want my file ground down to where it's so slick. It don't ever cut nothing. The plan of redemption is still the same. There must be conviction, what I was talking about a while ago. There must be contrition. What does that mean? It means an attitude toward our sin. We must see ourselves as sinners. You've got to see yourself as a sinner. People don't want people say, "Oh, you're great, you're wonderful, you're great, you're wonderful." Don't ever tell kids. Tell kids. Do you tell? I hear people telling this, "Honey, you're wonderful. Honey, you're the best. Honey, you're great." Don't ever tell a kid something like that. That's a lie. They ain't wonderful, and they ain't the greatest, and they ain't the best. Say, so listen, you little sinner. <laughs> you're a sinner just like me, and we all need Jesus. That's true. That's true. That's true. They ain't wonderful and great and the best thing it's ever been. And mommy's little princess is going to be the most famous. Thing. You'll ruin a kid telling them junk like that. They'll grow up believing that kind of junk. Let me tell you what they need to grow up thinking. I'm a sinner, but Christ died for my sin. I'm, I'm a failure, but thank God he paid the price to get me out of this mess. That's contrition. And then there's confession. There's got to be confession, y'all. There's got to be confession. The Bible said, with, for the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with confession of the mouth unto salvation. Now, I know there's people can't talk. There's people that die on their death. I got it. I get it. But under normal circumstances, there will be a confession of faith with our mouth. That's right. Uh, believe and confess. Believe and confess him. Amen. Uh, I, we need to witness. We need to tell people about the Lord. We need, uh, if you say, well, I'm, I'm a Catholic and my trust is in Mary. I, I, your trust is in Mary? She lost Jesus for three days. One time, couldn't find him. You going to trust her? She couldn't find the Lord for three days and lost him. I ain't trusting her to get me nowhere. You know what Mary had to do? Mary had to get saved just like any other sinner. She sure did. Mary will not help you. Mary cannot help you. See, stuff like that right there is what I supposed to got filed off. I should have left that off so more people would listen to me. But it's a truth. Mary couldn't save a dead horse. How's that for a rough edge? It's true. She can't. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. We've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Now, see, that is controversial, and nobody wants to be controversial. Nobody wants to be a, anything controversial. Leave it off. We're going to let this world run right over us if we ain't careful. God help us to realize the plan of redemption has not changed. I like what this little old girl did. Uh, I heard the uh, word I read Ruckman, a bunch of them guys up preaching on the street in Rochester, New York, rough area, downtown Rochester, with young people, like our kids will go street preaching. And he said there's a hell's angel got mad and a teenage girl sitting there giving out tracts. And I've seen teenage girls just like this. Praise God for them. I wish we had a hundred in this church. And this hell's angel guy got off his motorcycle, had a leather jacket, changed everything, and pulled out a knife he said, you say one more word to me, girl, and I'm going to cut your throat. And that teenage girl, about 17, took one step back, pulled out a track out of her pocket, and stuck that track on the end of that knife blade. He said, read that. It'll keep you, keep so you won't have to go to hell. And turned around and walked off. You know what he did? Nothing. Wouldn't you like to know what went through that old boy's mind when he gave her the guts to do that? I mean, he'd probably turn into a preacher later on, you know. Ain't no telling what happened to that guy. You know what? We got to stand and tell this world God hadn't changed. It's still the same now as it always was. 
Look, people, I know the day we're living in. Good night. But it's still, God don't change. God don't change. And the plan of redemption don't change. Let me tell you something else. Punishment of rebellion ain't changed. The punishment of rebellion has not changed. All you people listen to me, for the saints or the sinners, when saints sin, they get punished. Sinners live in sin, they get punished. There is punishment to the saint. There's cleansing. You don't clean up your life, God will chastise you. If you're a Christian, if you're really a child of God and you refuse to live right, the Lord will whip you. He promised he would, he did. And if you still won't get right, he could and has took you out and take you to an early grave. Well, everybody knows people. They say, that person wouldn't listen. That person wouldn't listen. They kept on and on and on. I, I know preachers right now, I believe with all my heart, wasn't 50 years old, and they're in the grave tonight and this morning and tomorrow morning and tomorrow night and been for years because they absolutely rebel against God. Look, if you're really saved, here's what the old preacher used to say. You'll live right or you won't live long. If you're really saved. Oh, preacher, you shouldn't scare me. God's not me. No, God ain't being mean. You are. You're the one being mean. God's good. God wants to help you. But he chastises those that he loves. And he loves you so much he will not let you continually live in sin. He won't do it. He won't do it. If you're in here this morning and you're shacking up, living together, and you're not married, God will never bless that union. He will never bless that relationship. It can't be blessed. It's wrong. You say, well, if we get married, we'll lose our benefits. Well, you'd be a whole lot better off to have the blessings than them benefits. The government pays you to shack up. That's right, the punishment of the rebellion. And then sinners, sinners, sinners get paid by two ways. They either come to Jesus or they look for judgment on their sins, flat on their back in the lake of fire one of these days. God hadn't changed and his punishment of rebellion. You still believe in the lake of fire? It's what it said. What it said. I have no reason to doubt it. I have no good, solid, sound reason to doubt the Bible. The Bible said hell's in the center of the earth. And when scientists dig down there, guess what they find out? It's on fire down there. I have no reason to doubt what the Bible says. A, a book that can predict the future and never miss it one time, 300 things about in the life of Jesus, nails it every time, never gets it wrong, I'm pretty 99.9999% positive that the rest of it's right too. There's a hell. There's a hell. Then I'll say last time through, not only the punishment of rebellion, the plan of redemption, the program of revival, but the promise of his return. Ain't changed. He's still coming. He's still coming at the resurrection. Now what happens? People ask me this for years. Brother Danny, is mama in the grave? No. Mama ain't in the grave. Mama's soul goes to be with the Lord the second she dies. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Mama's body is in the ground. Mama's soul with the Lord. Now the Bible says when Jesus comes back in the, in the air, them which sleep, the people, the Christians that have died, God will bring with him. He's bringing their souls. When he brings their souls, their body comes up out of the grave. We call that the resurrection. That's the first part of the first resurrection. The first resurrection is in a, to a couple of different parts. That's the first uh, fruits. We're back here on an old, when he first rose from the dead. And then they that are Christ that he's coming. And then the gleanings and all them other resurrections. We'll talk about some other time. But they come up out of the grave like this. You say, well, their body's rotted. Don't make no problem. Ain't no big deal. Listen, I read, I read that there was, a, there was a place in Honolulu where in November 1943, 7,000 American and Japanese soldiers were killed in a battle in South Pacific. There were 400 pounds of bones of our soldiers shipped to an army mortuary in Honolulu. And they called in an anthropologist to try to identify the bone because people back home was wanting to know, is that my boy? Is that my girl? And they tried to identify 400 pounds of just nothing but bones. And they couldn't figure it out. But one of these days, 
when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise for God. You say, God, oh, their bones scatter. Out. That ain't no, look, he made the first man out of dust. You think if he can't make Adam out of dust, he can't call them bones back together? He did there in the book of Ezekiel. He did there. He caught their bones going to come back. Now think about that. Up out of the grave where fish eat them, buddy, in the ocean. They're all coming back. They're coming up out of the watery grave. They're coming back, and they'll get right back on their bones. And then my, my mom, my mom's been laying in the grave, her body. She's at home be the Lord. Up yonder since 2011. Ten years, my mom has been laying away. Her body will come back together and her soul will come with the Lord. I will rise with them to meet the Lord in the air. I get my new body. She gets her new body all at the same time. The bride meets the bridegroom. And then we go uh, st- uh, how to get all the wrinkles ironed out of our wedding garment. And, brother, we get all the, all the kink out and all the answers done. Then we're all fixed up and got on our wedding dress, brother. And we come back ready to marry him. And when he comes back in the millennium, we're married to him. And we're going to spend a thousand-year honeymoon on this earth ruling with our Savior. That's a, that's a, that's a marriage there, brother. Prince Charles, lady, get out of here, you you. You paupers. We're talking about somebody going to run the whole world with a, or a thousand years with his bride forever and ever and ever and ever. You ain't believe that, preacher? Yep, I sure do. I find no reason not to. All the rest of it happened. That'll happen also. The promise of his return. There's a place in Scottsdale, Arizona called the Alcor Life Extension Institution. People paid $120,000 to have their self froze. As soon as you die, you freeze them. And then whenever they figure out in scientists how to fix whatever happened to you, they'll thaw you back out, fix your brain, heart, whatever, hook you up to some kind of jumper cables, and you can have a life again in another 20, 30, 40 years. And they laugh at us for believing the Bible and the resurrection. Listen, even if they did find out something like that, they ain't going to resurrect them people. I done spent that 120000 Heck with them. We, we got too many people now. You think they're really going to bring you back and put you, get you started again? That's their hope. The rest of them ain't got no hope. I'm glad we hope, the hope of the resurrection is still real. I get, you'll get to see your mama again. you get to see your daddy again. I'll I close with this, Miss Desi. Come on. This girl husband shot her he shot her right here in the head and somehow or another the bullet went in her head right here and didn't get in her brain come out the back top of her head right there and it didn't kill her but it messed her up where she couldn't she was not not right mentally for, uh, for the rest of her life and she had a big old sunk in place right here with that bullet and they'd done surgery and everything tried to fix her and she was like a little child and she heard a preacher preach one time. She said, when Jesus comes, will I, I be able to be normal again? And he looked at her and he said, yes, honey. When Jesus comes, you'll have a body that won't have no hole in your head, no deformities. And that's the promise of the resurrection, people. No sickness, no heart monitors, no them blood pressure None of them stupid ventilators and, and shots and drugs, and we don't even know what, what it is. It's all over. I'm glad that ain't changed. I've got the promise of God that I'll see my family again one day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some things never change, y'all. Some things never change. You do well to put your faith in that right there. You do very well to yourself. You say, well, Brother Danny, there's so many distractions and sin so powerful. I understand that, buddy. I know. I live in the same world you do. But if you'll put your eyes on Jesus and determine in your heart to follow him, make up your mind you're going to do right, you'll come out on top. Let's do that. Let's all stand. Bow our heads for prayer, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, God, do what ought to be done right now. I thank you, Lord, for our church. Thank you the doors the Shining Light Baptist Church are still open. Pray they would be till Jesus comes. Oh, Lord, help us, Father, we pray. Bless this invitation. Do what ought to be done in every heart. If there's one here this morning, never been saved, let this be the day when they come to you, trust you for their own personal salvation. Please, God, 
speak to that heart, I pray. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. God's speaking to hearts here this morning. Just slide. Some's already coming. Why don't you just slide? Come on, Daddy. Mom, Mom, right now. Just slide right out of your seat. Get down here and say, you know what? I'm going to get back in there. I'm going to get back in there and serve God. I'm going to do right. I'm going to serve the Lord. Come on. Come on right now. Come on. Right now. Come on right now. Just get out of your seat. That's right. Others, others, others. You come on. Don't wait on somebody else. Don't see what somebody else is going to do. You, you do business with God. Just you and Him. You're the only one that can do it. I can't do it for you. You do business with God. He'll, he'll help you. Amen. 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 You let God help you this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost of God, come down here. Do a great and mighty work. Touch hearts. Change lives. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us, we pray. Touch every single person here this morning. Lord, God, do what ought to be done. Help that one that's struggling. Help that one, Lord. Lord, there's no accident that they were here this morning and are here. And, and I preach what I did. Lord, we know it's all been ordered by your spirit. And I believe that. I pray that you bless them today. Have you in our hearts. We'll thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 Amen.